thing on the human impact too. I, I think we've been maybe overrepresented the mammoth side of the story, but not the people side. And that's really the two fellows sitting back here, John and Doug, have really looked at that. They, they both looked at what kind of effect this would have on culture. So maybe, Doug, would you want to say a little something towards that? You know, what happened to the people? We, we know the mammoths were gone. Okay. Uh, well, I'll be talking about this and kind of look, trying to look at it, coming to gr grips with this event. I mean, as an archaeologist thinking about, you know, prehistoric culture and, and cultural change and human ecology, um, you know, being confronted with the idea that there was this major event at this time where we see clearly in the records, but known that there are major shifts in uh, human adaptations at this time that have been, um, uh, been, been known uh, in the archaeological record. And then going in, what we tried to do is go in and look at the archaeological record as it exists today, which was not designed, it was not, get, the, 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 the data gathered was not designed to test the specific question. So we're coming in and looking at the, the records across uh, North America with the idea that you know, perhaps this uh, event was the most severe up in the Great Lakes area and over into the east, and then thinking about you know, the, the most immediate effects versus the, the cascading ecological effects of what this would have meant, uh, what kind of, um, uh, what, what this would have meant for the human population. What, what, it would, you know, what kind of hypotheses can we do? Uh, develop to look at, uh, to address with the archaeological record because I think the archaeological record um, and archaeology will play a vital role in trying to understand the consequences of, of this. So what I'll be talking about tomorrow is we've done this and it's, this, is a, this is a massive project and this is a huge amount of data that's been generated over a hundred years of varying degrees, uh, uh, varying quality. Um, but what it seems is that that uh, that there are certainly stratigraphic breaks in, in the archaeological record. Uh, Alan West mentioned Blackwater Draw. Well, Blackwater Draw has a close occupation. Then you have this black layer with uh, ET impact materials. There's also a Folsom occupation at that site, but it's 500 years later. Um, uh, so that's, there's a 500 year break there. On the Channel Islands, where both John and I have done some work, there, there's no site there that has both you know, uh, Clovis and post-Clovis uh, uh, contemporary records uh, in the same spot, but there is uh, clear evidence for a Clovis age burial that John could probably speak a little bit to, um, and then it appears this layer, and then th the next occupation that we see on the Channel Islands is, a, is about 800 years later at a site called Daisy Cave. It's also true in the east. At a site called Shawnee Midisink, there's a Clovis age occupation, we don't. We haven't looked for the, the this black mat there, but there's also a break a thousand years later. You get um, late Paleo Indian peoples coming into that location. So, um, and then there are also a ver there's a variety of other evidence. Um, if you look at the distribution of projectile points across uh, North America, these very distinctive Clovis points, they're they're the you know pretty much the same from coast to coast. And then the most the post Clovis assemblages of, of projectile points, which our archaeologists have looked at, that are look like they're related. They have fluted bases. Uh, in the west, they're called Folsom, and there are a variety of other uh, different types of points in the, in the east. So there looks like there's a, a, a big kind of diversification in the east in, in these projectile point um, uh, tradition, uh, traditions. And there's also many fewer of them. Not that this is a very good tracer for population reduction, but there are, there's a big reduction in the number of those kinds of points in the east. Uh, there's a poster about that that uh, uh, Al Goodyear will be presenting uh, at, in one area in, in our talk when we we'll talking about that reduction. And there also seems to be, there are very few definitive post-Clovis um, sites in the east. It's very difficult. The, 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 the one site that we can identify that has clear stratigraphy, a nice suite of, our, uh, of radiocarbon dates, is in northern Alabama. It's called Dust Cave. I'll talk about that. And there's a major gap between Clovis and, and the occupation at that, at that location, about 500 years. There are many more sites in, in the west of Folsom Age, but there looks like um, there are people there. Perhaps this is like a refugia for people uh, in the west. Um, there seem to be sites that are date to immediately after, although it is a statistical possibility that there is a gap in those records as well. And I'll talk more about that tomorrow in my presentation. And also the